So today, we're going to talk about saber-tooth cats, which is a group of animal pretty much everybody is superficially familiar with. We've all seen them in movies and documentaries all the time. We've probably all seen the skulls and skeletons of them in museums. But it's something that, once you get past that, a lot of people tend not to know that much about these animals. They're a relatively unique group of cats, and they are called Macarodontinae, uh, which literally does just mean saber or sword toothed cats. And they lived from about 16 million to 10,000 years ago. And between those times, if you went pretty much anywhere on Earth except for Australia or Antarctica, you stood a good chance of running into a species of these. They were quite well distributed during the last ice age. But you'll notice we don't really have any of them left today. So there's about 15 different species, five in each of the three different groups. So the first two, the first group is probably the one you're the most familiar with. It is the most famous. It's called Smilodonti, and that's where you get Smilodon, the cat that everyone knows. This gets in documentaries all of the time. They had these wonderfully long sabers. They were massive animals. They're almost around the same size as a modern day tiger. And they live from about 2.5 million years ago to 10,000 million years ago in North and South America at various times. They hunted very large prey, and they were one of the animals that were very, very well suited to what we call the American biotic interchange when North and South America collided and wildlife from two isolated habitats began interacting. These animals did really well. They, in fact, pretty much ecologically as a top predator, took over South America relatively quickly. So the next group of cats we're going to go over is the Metallurini. And when we get into these two cats, um, they're not as well known. So we have Dinophilus, which lived from about 5 million years ago to 1.2 million years ago. It was found in Africa, but it's relatively well represented in the fossil record. You've, there are a lot of fossils and skeletons of these cats and they were from what we can tell very successful animals uh, these animals actually had quite a hostile relationship with our own ancestors this is an australopithecus africanus skull a lot of these are often found in bone beds that we find under trees and such where animals like dinophilus probably dragged their prey and when they were done eating you know, the bones would fall in and a lot of these skulls and bones will have the telltale marks of these large sabered teeth. So uh, they think Dinophilus did like the leopard like? They do. They have a lot of good evidence because of the tooth marks that really only could have come from the saber toothed cat of the area. And the fact that we have the pretty plentiful actually unfortunate Australopithecine skulls uh, to give us that data. But these were probably one of my favorites just because they weren't actually as large as some of the other ones they were probably almost the size of a jaguar which sounds big to us but when you think of a lot of these saber tooth cats these are cats that are bigger than some lions today on average and then we get into another one that i have kind of a soft spot for which is the homotherini and the main species we're going to talk about with these is homotherium homotherium lived about four million years ago to twelve thousand years ago and these ones actually probably interacted with modern humans more than the other species that we know of. These were widely, this species was widely distributed everywhere from Africa, Eurasia, and the Americas at some time in this range. They were really successful during the last ice age. They were a decently large one. And kind of cool, I think, is they were depicted in cave art of various types a lot. We see drawings on cave walls. And recently, we found a carving of one made out of mammoth ivory a couple of years ago, which actually changed the way we look at these animals. So, I'm sure you have all seen reconstructions of these cats that have the big teeth hanging out. But, at least in Homotherium's case, we now actually know from cave art and this carving that was recently found that they most likely had very large jowly lips that covered their teeth most of the time. And 
it's always fun when art from the past can sometimes help us. And these Stone Age people were nothing if, left, if not prolific artists of the wildlife of their time and locations. So, with these three families of cats, the distinguishing feature that separates each one from the other is the general shape of the tooth. So, Smilodonti had what we would just call flat teeth. If you look at the profile of these teeth, they're very narrow if you're looking at it from the front. It's a very smooth edge, and they're very long. All of these cats, the general trend is very long fangs, and we're going to show you. They actually can open their jaws a lot wider than modern day cats, because you have to get it so you can actually get the tips of these teeth to bite your prey. Now, the other family, so we're going to look at the homotherini, had serrated teeth. So think a very similar shape to the smilodon teeth, but they're actually serrated a lot like a uh, sharp tooth. And this is a replica of a megalodon tooth. And you can actually see on the edge these little kind of, it's almost a jagged edge. And that increases the ability to cut. And lastly, we have the metallurini, which had conical teeth. These cats' sabers were essentially just longer versions of what's in your own house cat's mouth today, very rounded teeth. And these were probably a little bit more durable. Now, one of the things a lot of people think is, why sabers? And that is actually still kind of a bit of a question among scientists. A general consensus is that these cats hunted very large prey. Um, they were specialized for something like a bison size or larger because, unfortunately, these teeth aren't actually that durable. We oftentimes find these animals' skeletons, especially Smilodon, with broken sabers. They probably could not handle hit directly hitting bone, and that was very likely a problem for them when large prey went extinct at the end of the last ice age. This is the leading theory because of the next question, which is, why don't we see these teeth on predators today? You'll notice that we don't have any really big prominent saber-toothed cats today. And the reason is probably because animal body size generally has trended towards, compared to the past, smaller. Meaning that these large carnivores don't have the same large herbivores to prey on constantly. Another thing about these cats that I always like to uh, tell people is they weren't built like modern day cats exactly. They tended to have very long, at least front legs, and their front legs were a lot more mobile and a lot more dexterous, almost like arms. And a, a big theory about that is that they used their front paws to actually restrain their prey rather than risking their teeth. And they also tended to have a little bit more sloped backs. Smilodon's actually quite famous for essentially its back from shoulders to hips kind of being like just a, a very steep slope compared to a lot of modern cats. But these cats were hugely influential, not just in just biological history, but also in our own human history. Humans interacted with these animals quite a lot. And they captured our imagination for quite a long time. Uh, Ryan, you think there's anything you'd like to ask about these? Anything you want to add? Um, let's see. So one of the things I think was kind of interesting that you were talking about is the just now you were talking about how they're so much more bulky in the front than a lot of modern day cats are. And when I hear that, I think of almost being more similar to how a lot of dogs are built, where it's very much in the front. In the front. And often, often they are cited as having the proportions limb-wise more of a hyena uh, than a cat. And it's interesting that you talk about too, because restraining with the front, like you don't typically associate modern day cats as like, you know, tackling a thing and then killing it. They're trying to bring it down all simultaneously. Kill it before they actually have to fight it at all. Yeah, and that just came with probably these big sabers, is they're a really effective killing tool as a predator, but they're also, it's a high risk, high reward. If you break that, you're out of business. The other thing I, I think I forgot to mention is these were not Earth's only saber-toothed predators, actually, throughout 
Earth's history, there have been various types of animals that have gone with this. And if I just have a big, big cutting and stabbing tooth, it's probably useful strategy. And it kind of makes the modern day a little bit of the, the odd, odd time out where we don't have a big saber tooth. Well, and predator. obviously you don't see it so much in predators anymore, but you do see animals these days that have big long teeth like this. There's, yeah, you see the walrus. <laughs> well, in any tusk thing, basically, things even like uh, boars and whatnot. Yeah. And another thing about these, I just, I just find them very fascinating because, again, we don't have cats like these days. Like, their body types, they're very different. That long slope, they tend to have these bobbed tails, which aren't super common today. Uh, and then the fact that they did tend towards a pretty large size, like when the smallest one is roughly the size of a jaguar, the jaguar is the third largest cat in the world, and they are very beefy cats. Jaguars, unlike most cats who go for the throat for a killing blow, jaguars go for the back of the skull because they have the jaw force to actually just crush it, which tells you these cats were very well adapted for very rough yeah. lifestyles the, the short tail is an interesting point too because you're right you don't see any cats that do that anymore of that size you yeah. know you see bobcats yeah. and lynx today caracals in africa servals even but you don't think of like a tiger-sized cat a little nubby tail which it, the, the long tail is like a balance thing for like chase down and stuff yeah it shows that these animals probably weren't engaging in super long chases potentially especially given that they they had these shorter back legs that probably weren't going to be giving them as much speed. So they probably were ambush predators, and they probably relied on catching something big when it wasn't expecting it, and hoping that enough of them could bring it down. Because they were, they are heavily thought to be social cats as well, which is the other kind of unusual trait about a lot of them. Um, you'll find oftentimes a lot of skeletons together, and evidence of multiple cats being present at kill sites especially with Smilodon. That's one of the reasons I think Smilodon's so famous is because it can be sort of analogized to modern day lions, where it's that big charismatic animal and it has a frame of reference for people now where- And obviously it's the North American one too, so. Yeah, it's the North American one. And it, it also is probably one of the, like these three that we talked about are very common in the fossil record. Uh, and even Smilodon, they're not even old enough where all of them are fossils. Some of them are actually skeletons you'll find in the La Brea Tar Pits. Uh, back home, I'm from California, the La Brea Tar Pits are a really fun place, and you get a lot of amazing predator skeletons, and saber-toothed cats were a very, very common animal there, which shows that they were successful enough to be very common. It's really difficult with predators in the fossil record often to get good evidence of how successful and how common they were around like how many were in the ecosystem these cats were really well known for doing great they were everywhere because when you see species like homotherium which was found on multiple continents this animal was really well adapted for the time it lived and i think a lot of times with these prehistoric animals people tend to think that yeah it's just like a worse version of something we got today they tend to think that modern animals are just inherently a little bit better but Animals are always adapted to their specific habitats, and these animals were probably some of the best predators for that time in Earth, and there are large-bodied herbivores everywhere. These guys were at the top of the food chain for a reason. They were amazingly successful. Yeah, and the, the peril in that is always being that successful oftentimes means that you are very, very hyper-specialized for one specific environment, and then when that environment changes, you are in a rough spot. Yeah, I oftentimes like to talk about the cheetah as well when I talk about saber-toothed cats, because these were very specialized, but when the environment they were specialized for and the ecosystem started to change, they weren't able to change with it. And cheetahs today face a very similar plight, where they are very specialized for that small, fast prey. But as uh, habitat loss has affected prey populations, and as their specialization is kind of coming back to bite them where they're not really big and strong enough to scare off other predators, they're not doing as well ecologically. And it's... I, uh, those regular watchers, I recently did a watch of the, the cat tier list just a couple days ago on here. And oh, said yeah. I, uh, I did my own tier list ahead of time, and I put cheetahs as bottom tier, and so did tier zoo also put cheetahs as bottom tier. And when we when we do stuff like that, mostly those tier lists are in good fun because yeah. animals are specialized. Like, 
it might not be the best generalist animal, but it is the fastest living land mammal for like top speed. It's an animal that can cover three football fields in approximately nine seconds, yeah, which, when you think of it, is amazing. Seventy miles an hour or so. Yeah, yeah, it's faster than the North American pronghorn, which hits like sixty-five. But yeah, yeah, no. So like, I I love stuff like that. These very specialized animals because they, ironically, the thing is, while the fossil record in the past is a mystery to us, these specialized animals like this can tell us a lot about what the ecosystem was like purely by how they were how they looked, how they were adapted, because you don't get adaptations for nothing. They are to serve a purpose. They make an animal more efficient at survival. Yeah. So how these animals are shaped really does give us a clearer picture of the past and the past that involves a lot of us. Uh, these animals overlapped with a lot of early humans. Um, they were probably a huge presence for even like pre-human history. Yeah, it's a very good point because one of the things that we've talked about on these shows, too, is how um, certain species are much more likely to, to keep in the fossil record than others, and so it's really Long. easy to get a very skewed view of the past. But, you know, if you flip your perspective a little bit and start thinking about, you know, saber-toothed cats, not just in the context of saber-toothed cats, but the environment saber-toothed cats are interacting with, you can get a little bit fuller picture, even if you don't have the direct evidence of the things they're interacting with. You can get clues based on how they're it's probably how they look, yeah. But yeah, so hopefully actually we can probably continue doing stuff like this in the future where we look at specific groups of prehistoric animals.